Archives are about space and about time. There is always a hidden something that we have to look for very carefully. A hidden concept, a hidden document, and a hidden narrative. How can we preserve an archive? And how can we preserve documents in an archive? Archives are very important as a protest against forgetting. If we want to anticipate the future, the lessons of history as a discipline are central to the art of archiving. The future is sometimes invented with fragments from the past. First of all, uh, Justin, I would like to thank you so very much on behalf of the Norman Foster Foundation for being with us, uh, for having accepted to join us in this series about archives. I think it's a great pleasure to have Falling Water, which is almost, you know, so close to, to the Norman Foster Foundation, because I always have the impression that, you know, Falling Water is not an archive. The building itself is part of the archive itself, exactly uh, like in the Norman Foster Foundation, because it's really the memories of the architect, the universe of the architect, etc. And maybe if you feel it's okay, maybe we could start by describing a bit, you know, Falling Water Archive for uh, those viewers of ours who are uh, in front of the computer. Sure, sure. Well, let me just extend my thanks for, for the invitation to participate in a conversation with you all. So my deepest gratitude to everyone at the Norman Foster Foundation. So thank you very much. Um, but yeah, I, I, you know, I think the building itself is our primary archival record um, here at, at Falling Water. So it really is about the experience of, of the space, the transformative power of that space to take you back into the past uh, and experience it at the present, but also make you think about how you can apply lessons learned through that experience into your everyday lives and then into thinking about how we build and live into the future. So the building itself really is is our primary archive, but of course behind the scenes there's there's of course uh, what we call our archival storage building or collection storage building, where we maintain all of the the records and archives for the institution. Um, so that uh, ranges from the uh, you know, drawings of falling water by Frank Lloyd Wright, the originals of course are which at the Avery, uh, but we have copies of uh, we have a, a large collection of correspondence by the Kaufman family, which were the family that Falling Water was constructed for. So lots of personal correspondence, home movies, audio recordings uh, of the family. Um, and then of course there's great institutional record. Uh, Falling Water was donated by the Kaufman family to the Western Pennsylvania Conservancy in 1963. And then it opened as a museum to the public in 1964. It actually has the distinction in the United States of being the first work of modern architecture to open uh, as a public site. Um, so we have that great institutional record. Um, of course, long history of stewardship and preservation here that is archived uh, and can serve as a resource to scholars, preservationists, um, artists, designers that are interested. Um, so not only the house, but uh, behind the scenes, a full archive uh, of record and, and correspondence. Well, that sounds, it's, it's, it's so fascinating, you know, because I think today the, the very idea of, of an archive has changed so much because there has so many typologies, you know, that's why I was applying, of course, it's a very different idea because of course the building has been um, restored by um, Norman Foster, not built by Norman Foster, but still it's full of his, you know, memories, obsessions, Absolutely. Um, you know, <laughs> All, all, that, all these beautiful things that conform the architect's universe, you know, that's what I was saying. So, um, and I think it's so interesting, you know, that, um, you know, Falling Water, I think it's a great example because if, in fact, as, as you said, um, you know, the building itself is part of the archive. It's, it's the main object of the archive, as a matter of fact. Um, exactly. So what is the mission of, of, of this archive? What, what would you think the mission of your Falling Water uh, as, a, as a different idea of an archive, as an expanded archive, whatever you want to call it. What is the mission of Falling Water? Because I think you have a very yeah. different mission. Of course. I mean, I, I think our, pri our primary mission here at Falling Water is to, through the architecture, to explore ways that human habitation can harmonize with the natural world. 
that's the primary mission of Falling Water. And through all of our interpretation of not only the physical space, but also the archival record, it's about that relationship between people and nature, enhancing that understanding. Um, and interestingly, you know, here at Falling Water, our primary mission is not necessarily to speak solely about Frank Lloyd Wright. Uh, there are many organizations, the Frank Lloyd Wright Foundation, the Frank Lloyd Wright Building Conservancy, among others, that focus on the Frank Lloyd Wright legacy and uh, maintaining that legacy. Here at Falling Water, we focus on the real message of the architecture, which is about that connection, connection to landscape, connection to nature, how we can build more responsibly uh, and, and pay attention to siting of architecture, use of local materials, sustainable practices, green practices. So that's really where we're pushing our interpretation uh, here at Falling Water. Uh, and, and interestingly, when the family donated the house to the public realm, um, Edgar Kaufman Jr. actually made a comment that he'd rather have objects broken and stolen than to inter interfere in any way on the interpretation of the architecture about that connection to nature. So in terms of our stewardship, while we're responsible stewards of the, the collections, mm -hmm. um, you know, the windows and doors are thrown open uh, to allow outside to interact with the interior. There are no ropes or stanchions. There's no signage. There are no vitrines protecting items in the collection. It's very about, much about the immersion into the architecture and how we can connect people to that primary message, which is that interaction between architecture and landscape. Um, so that's our primary goal. Yeah, I think those who have visited Falling Water, I know that very well, because it's really a very special, a very special visit and a very special experience, you know, because you really feel, and it's, you know, it's, I think in, it's premonitory to a certain extent, because, you know, now we're talking about sustainability and this is, I mean, that's what, and, and uh, this was an idea that was sought ages ago. And, and you know, this is so, this is so, it, it's not only gaining momentum, but, you know, it's, it's something that is, you know, under discussion today, it's our main discussion. And I think, you know, the power of experiencing architecture uh, in an immersive way, um, it, it really is unlike any other kind of museum or archive experience. When you are immersed in an architectural space in a domestic realm like at Falling Water, it's one that's multi-sensory. So not only are you getting kind of an intense visual experience of something very beautiful, um, but you, you are, um, you know, you're smelling the woods and you're feeling the humidity of the cool stream underneath the house. Every sense is engaged and amplified by the experience of the place. And I think that intensity translates um, in, in a way that connects to everyone, no matter what your background in architecture or design is, because experiences of domestic spheres and because of, of experiences of nature are familiar to all of us, um, falling water is accessible um, and remains relevant to everyone because it's something that's familiar, but in a very elevated, uh, enhanced way. Very elevated. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but what I mean to say is that this is something that comes out of my personal curiosity. Do you think the relationship to the public has changed now that nature is one of these big issues, you know, under discussion? I, I do, I do. And, you know, I, I think maybe a silver lining of, of the pandemic that we've all uh, faced over the past year and a half, um, we, we've all spent more time in our own homes. Um, so I think we have more of an understanding about what the environments around us do to our individual psyches and how important that is to us. Um, so being able to experience a space like falling water, which, which as we mentioned, is kind of an elevated, enhanced uh, domestic experience. I think that translates to people's personal lives and wanting to enhance and improve their own, their own homes. Um, but also throughout the entire pandemic, we all sought ways to escape <laughs> yeah. uh, and to get outside and to find ways to connect more with nature. 
Um, and I think that's becoming, um, has become and is becoming more and more a part of what we look for in our lives. Um, so not only where we live and, and, and work, but where we play and nature seems to become more and more uh, that place. Uh, we're kind of escaping to um, the, the enjoyments of being, being outdoors. So in architecture that is inherently founded in that idea of connecting to, to nature really has impact and relevance today. And I think it has intensified. Yeah, I think, you know, in, in most European cities, people are, I mean, lots of people are trying to move into the country, you know, because, I mean, even close to cities, but, you know, trying to find a place which is close to nature, because I think, you know, probably you're absolutely right. Through pan the pandemic, we had the idea or the need, you know, to be more in the open air and to taste nature more closely, something we had really forgotten probably for a century. And Absolutely. now I think it's coming back. So it's interesting, you know, that's why I said that came out, out of my own curiosity, how people were approaching this amazing immersive experience, like, you know, visiting falling water. Well, and it gets to the roots of why the house was created originally, which was to escape the smog and smoke of the steel city of Pittsburgh. Um, so the, the family um, sought out the mountains for, for fresh air and recuperation in nature. Uh, and that's what we're doing again today. And, and, and tell me, what about preservation? Because I suppose, you know, preservation at Falling Water is a very important issue, isn't it? Because of the actual uh, place where it is. And, and you know, the, this, you were talking about humidity, you were talking about nature. Of course, I mean, the preservation and at the same time, how this was like a real home with real objects and real things and and of course but i mean when you have a real home your real home never mind but i mean when you have a like a like a national treasure uh, <laughs> you, know, you have to sort of you know uh, negotiate the combination between um between conservation and preservation and at the same time keeping the spirits of falling water so maybe you would like to tell us something about that question. sure yeah i mean i think we're, we're all familiar with the challenges of, of home ownership. So, you, you know, you're always thinking about repairs, replacing your roof every 20 years, repainting every five years. Um, just take your own home and think about the power of 10 of your experiences at your own home and, and uh, the challenges that we deal with here at Falling Water. And it's kind of, you know, it's interesting to think. So Frank Lloyd Wright's primary inspiration for the architecture was the idea of the cascade, the idea of this flowing stream and, and the waterfalls. Um, so the form of the architecture is a sculptural expression of the stream. He wrote that he designed falling water to the music of the stream. So it's meant to be essentially a, a, a symphony in a way of, of this idea of the, of the cascade. Um, so the primary inspiration is water, and it's kind of ironic that our number one enemy in terms of preservation is also the stream mm -hmm. and also water. Um, so we're constantly combating um, humidity, um, the, the stream below the house, um, and, and rain and snow, um, which every building is always combating. Uh, Frank Lloyd Wright once wrote that falling water was like leaving art out in the rain. Um, and it is like a work of sculpture, a work of fine art that we're constantly trying to figure out the best ways to, to conserve. Yeah, um, it's so like a sculpture, very pretty much like a sculpture, yeah. It, it is, it is. Um, so there's inherent challenges that we're constantly dealing with just from the way that the house is constructed with flat roofs and reinforced concrete construction, um, mm -hmm. all hand laid stone masonry. Um, so there's just cyclical care that's ongoing. Um, we do a 20 year comprehensive preservation plan. Uh, the last one was done in 1999 and then we just recently updated it in 2019. Mm -hmm. So we're well prepared for our next 20 years uh, in the work that we have to implement to ensure the house's long-term preservation. So work like that means we are replacing all of the waterproofing assemblies on the flat roofs that were done almost two decades ago. We're constantly repointing stone masonry to prevent water infiltration from going into that stonework. We're patching and repairing the reinforced concrete uh, because of hairline cracks that get created through expansion and contraction of the, of of the seasons. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just, it's ongoing, just like your own house, <clears throat> just 
elevated even more. Yeah, yeah, well, quite elevated, actually, as I said, because this is, I mean, this is like a national uh, treasure, like a, like a, like a, like an international treasure. And, and how, and to what extent and how do you think falling water can uh, help disseminate architecture? Because I think it's a very important... It, it is. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, I, I, I think back to the 1960s and 70s, uh, which is essentially when the American preservation movement was founded. Um, and the fact that falling water came into the public domain at that time in 1964, um, it, the house by being placed in, into the public realm, I think it played an important role um, even in the 60s and 70s and helping to promote the preservation of, of modern architecture at that time um, as the American preservation movement was just starting to get some feet underneath it. Um, in the 60s, many Franklin Wright buildings were already getting torn down that were only 20, 30, 40 years old. Um, so by having exposure of falling water, a house that I think anyone can connect to because it is such a tour de force and such a fantastic uh, work of architecture. Um, it, it played an important role uh, in promoting the importance of modernism and preservation of modernism and understanding of modernism. Yeah, I think this um, is a problem that we all share around the world, isn't it? I mean, we think 40 years is nothing. And then 100 years later, we realize 40 years was a lot. You know, exactly. this, is, this is a common problem, you know, all over the world. And, uh, so and it's, think, you know, it's always that sliding scale of, yeah, of what, we, what we define as important. Um, so now we're looking at, you know, postmodern works and more contemporary works. Yeah, uh, and, and I, think you, I think you have a point there because, in fact, you know, falling water is so, is so strong, is so, is so sculpture like that, you know, I think people um, are, I mean, you have seen this and you will never forget it, okay? Because it's so, and I think, you know, this I, is- I think that's right. And there's a timelessness to it um, that a lot of architecture doesn't have. Um, I, it's it's hard for me to believe that we're, we're almost at 85 and we'll be a hundred pretty before we know it. Um, so to think that falling water is reaching the century mark um, where it still feels so intensely contemporary uh, it's, amazing. Anyways, it's amazing yeah um, it, it has a power there that um can be used to to benefit preservation of architecture as a whole yeah i think i think absolutely right and in fact you know you um uh you had the, uh, the idea of submitting fallen water to the un uh world heritage list how did it come around yeah, that was a long process. So it actually, um, ideas emerged in the early 90s to list Frank Lloyd Wright works uh, on the UNESCO World Heritage List. So it started with uh, Taliesin and Taliesin West um, attempting to get on the U.S. tentative list for uh, World Heritage Inscription. Um, and then that evolved. Um, the Park Service at that time came back to the Franklin Wright Building Conservancy, which was the organization kind of spearheading mm -hmm. the push to think a little bit broader than, than just the, the homes of, of the architect, of the, of the genius, mm -hmm. um, and to expand and think a little bit more broadly uh, into a serial nomination mm -hmm. of, of a representative body of, of, of the work. So that grew into, um, I believe 10, 10 or 11 sites were considered as a serial nomination to the U.S. tentative list, which actually did make it onto the list in 2008. Mm -hmm. um, and then the formal work began of creating the, the dossier to submit to the World Heritage Committee. Uh, and that was done in 2016. So it took a big chunk of time to pull it all together um, through the guidance of ECOMOS and, and, uh, and others on the Franklin Wright Building Conservancy. Um, and it was uh, referred during the initial attempt in 2016. Mm -hmm. uh, the nomination was um, revised and updated, resubmitted to uh, the committee in 2019 um, with eight sites uh, and then was inscribed uh, in July of 2019. So it's almost a 20 year process to go through uh, all of the logistics of inscription, creating the dossier, navigating uh, the bureaucracy uh, that is involved with uh, getting a property on the UNESCO World Heritage List. But it's so intensely important <clears throat> for not just falling water in, <clears throat> excuse me, 
not just Falling Water and the other seven sites that are included in the serial nomination, but because over almost 400 works are still extant designed by Frank Lloyd Wright, mm -hmm. the nomination serves as, as a tool to speak yeah. about all of Frank Lloyd Wright's uh, work and to advocate for the preservation of all of those uh, existing buildings. And even to advocate for the preservation of his legacy and of his archives, um, because there are countless designs that were, were never constructed. Um, which have so many lessons that we can learn from. Um, we're actually next year putting together an exhibition. Uh, we're working with a, a local museum here called the Westmoreland Museum of American Art. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna explore uh, the unrealized projects commissioned by the Kaufmans uh, with Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, so Edgar Kaufman, in addition to building Falling Water was a leader uh, in the Renaissance of Pittsburgh in the 40s uh, and 50s, and, and commissioned Wright to design a civic center for downtown Pittsburgh, mm -hmm. a, park, a parking garage for his department store business, a mm -hmm. high rise. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I said which was 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 which, uh, which year was that? So this is all in the late 30s and 1940s. Um, so Edgar Kaufman is working with Wright on designs for a civic center for Pittsburgh, um, which was a monumental kind of fantastical structure at the point where three rivers come together in downtown Pittsburgh. Um, a high rise apartment building in the Mount Washington neighborhood of Pittsburgh, a parking garage, um, and then additional buildings here at Falling Water, a rhododendron chapel, a gatehouse. Now, well, um, Pittsburgh is a very exciting city. Absolutely. And, you know, during the, the 40s, you know, as they're trying to think about an urban renaissance. Oh, it's um, amazing, isn't it? Right, right was an opportunity to, to think uh, in new directions. Mm -hmm. um, so we're going to create these unrealized plans in the virtual realm through mm -hmm. animations, uh, augmented virtual reality experiences so that people can even learn from the unrealized works. No, they will. That's yeah. That's a that's a very good idea. And and you know, as I said before, you know, anything to disseminate, anything to make, you know, to make the general public sort of conscious that we have precious treasures there, and we have to exactly. keep exactly. And I think you know, you, the UNESCO thing is 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 good for that. Either you get it, get the prize or not. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's a it's a great honor, and I think the 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 benefit for for the Frank Lloyd Wright sites is to spread the word more internationally. I think yeah, the yeah, so UNESCO yeah. World Heritage List means it's so a, much to the it, international. Think about buildings community. and you know, they're discussed and they are discussed exactly. internationally. And I think, you know, this is what a friend of mine always says, never mind if you get it or not. I mean, the important thing is to be there and you know, your, your, your building or your site spoke, spoken about, et cetera. Exactly. And, um, and, um, how do you think, you know, because of course now we are, um, you know, in the digital era and of course, I mean, this is, you know, it's a big change, not only in, in, in terms of archives, I think it's, it's, but basically in the terms of archives, you know, the digital era, I think has, you know, changed dramatically our view of the world. Um, do you think that has affected uh, Fallen Water for one thing or, well, you were saying before that you're going to, to play uh, in the best um, ways with unfinished or unbuilt buildings of Frank Lloyd Wright, you know, with plants, et cetera, sort of, you know, making um, these um, projects to, to become true to a certain extent virtually, if I did understood, if, uh, well, if I did understand well. Um, so how do you think the digitalization has affected fallen water in the sense of archive at fallen water, et cetera, et cetera? I think it's hugely important. I mean, we we always want to create a duplicity in our archival record for, for long-term preservation. Um, so of course we have the physical record. We also want to transform, translate that physical record into a digital and virtual one. Um, so here at Falling Water, we've laser scanned the whole building. We're in the process of creating a virtual three-dimensional model uh, mm -hmm. of Falling Water. Um, and then our plan is to create essentially a virtual filing cabinet for our archives. So what I mean by that is a, a navigable um, virtual model that you can, in essentially three-dimensional space, go inside falling water and be able to understand the entire archival record uh, of the building. 
meaning you can click on a painting or a piece of furniture in that virtual model and then attached to it in virtual space is a full filing cabinet of all of the conservation records and history of that object or click on a wall surface uh, in the house and understand when that wall surface was repainted or repaired. Um, and I think too, not only from the archival standpoint, but from an accessibility standpoint, a model like that uh, can go a long way in terms of providing access to populations that have physical limitations that prevent them from visiting in person, mm -hmm. or they could be across the globe and don't have the financial resources to come and visit in person. So just the educational benefits of, of experiences that we can provide virtually can go a long way in disseminating uh, the importance and significance of this place. Yeah, it's 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 it's, it's probably going to be a more inclusive inclusive experience. Absolutely, you know, absolutely. People can can benefit, you know, from the beauty of falling water. You, I think we uh, you're talking about different collections, and we didn't mm -hmm. we didn't we didn't speak about them, and and they're very amazing, you know. Maybe you could shortly, you know, give us a hint about what is collected uh, in. Sure. The sure. Because so that's we, for granted, you know, but but I think, you know, for those ha who have, haven't visited Fallen Water yet, I think it's got, or yeah, they, don't, they haven't seen your, um, your new project um, uh, on three dimensions. I think it's interesting because you have really amazing objects. Yeah, oh yeah, we have um, the, in, the complete original collection uh, is still with the house. Mm -hmm. um, so included in that collection of fine and decorative art are over 170 pieces of Frank Lloyd Wright designed furniture that's site specific to falling water that's in the form of side tables, coffee tables, built in banquettes, cabinetry work. Um, and then we have over four centuries of, of art that was collected by the Kaufman family. Um, so through their department store business, they had buying offices all over the world, um, over 20 of them. So the family was constantly traveling to those buying offices and along the way collecting and bringing back art to their homes uh, to, and to falling water. Um, so it's a diverse collection, uh, it works by Picasso, Diego Rivera, four centuries of work. I mean, tif tons of Tiffany pieces are scattered throughout the house, um, Japanese woodblock prints. Um, and the great thing about the art collection is while it's always secondary to the architectural experience, it provides great opportunities for discussions about the history of the family and creates that more personal context for how the house was used and enjoyed. Um, and uh, the Kaufmans, because they were progressive thinkers, um, they were so connected with the artists and designers of the modern movement um, that you know, looking at one of the works by Diego Rivera allows you to tell stories about the friendships the Kaufmans had with Frida Kahlo and Diego Rivera, their travels to Mexico City to spend time with them. Um, so it, there's just kind of limitless opportunities uh, to delve into different stories. Um, and I think that's what visitors, of course they connect to the architecture, um, but through those personal experiences, it humanizes the space mm -hmm. a bit more uh, and, and gives us different opportunities to, to speak about the power of the place. Yeah, and I think, you know, it gives a visitor, it gives all of us uh, the opportunity of knowing a bit better the taste of a, of a, of a specific moment, of course, from a very sophisticated Absolutely. family, but, you know, the taste, of, the taste and the worries of a specific moment in history in the US, and I think, you know, probably internationally. And, um, well, I think, the, you know, this, there is something that uh, intrigues me a lot of our archives, how the private becomes public and then the private um, the public becomes private again when the researcher is, is, is working on the archive itself. And, you know, and I think in that respect, you know, um, Fallen Water is a very good example of this kind of shifting between public and private in an oh, archive. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I, I, and, I, and I, you know, I, I love delving into the, the family's personal correspondence as you're researching items that are in our collection. Uh, just as, as an example, I'll, I'll return to Diego Rivera, but there's Edgar Kaufman Jr., um, the son of the family, as he's trying to figure out what he wants to do with his life at his kind of coming of age, um, started working at the Museum of Modern Art um, and traveled down to Mexico as a research assistant 
they were pulling together uh, an exhibition on Latin American art uh, in the early 1940s. So there's these wonderful letters where the son is writing back to his parents about the time he's spending with Diego Rivera and Frida Kahlo. And there, there's one excerpt from a letter where the son is, is speaking about riding around with Diego Rivera in his station wagon uh, to various markets throughout Mexico to buy pre-Columbian artifacts. And we have a small collection of pre-Columbian artifacts here at Falling Water. And I often wonder if Diego Rivera was helping Edgar Kaufman Jr. pick out the ones that we have here at Falling Water. So there's just these great stories that you could connect directly to the archival record to the, to the physical objects uh, in the house. Well, I'm sure it's fascinating work in, in Falling Water, uh, Justin. So um, uh, I think we have come to our time. Is there anything you want to add, by the way? Something you would like to discuss and I haven't sort of pointed out in, in, in my conversation? No, I mean, I think just some other, you know, opportunities for dissemination. Uh, you know, we have a, an internship program at Falling Water. Uh, so preservation, landscape architecture, digital media, collections, education. We have uh, seven to 12 interns here uh, each summer. Mm -hmm. That affords us opportunities to educate, but also, you know, they always have new ways of, of um, influencing us on how we, we steward the place. So that's great learning opportunities, not just for the students, uh, but for the professional staff here at Falling Water. Um, and we have an active artist and scholar in residence program Oh, I, that's interesting. Um, mm -hmm. so, so the Kaufman family long understood the power of this place mm -hmm. um, and often used it as a location for creativity, critical discourse. Mm -hmm. Actually, during the early 1940s, during World War II, the Kaufmans brought together great minds of the American Jewry to talk about the atrocities going on in Europe and, and how mm -hmm. the U.S. could participate in, in ending those. Um, Albert Einstein, among others, were brought to Falling Water for those, those discussions uh, in the 1940s. So we've tried to keep that idea of Falling Water really? being a place of creative discourse um, on. Uh, and ever since 1964, when the house opened as a museum, we've hosted artists and scholars and residents. Um, and I think it's all about, yes, there, there's the, the physical experience of the place, but there's a way that we can translate the lessons of the architecture in new and creative ways to engage with different audiences. Um, so through artists doing things like sound installations, mm -hmm. uh, landscape interventions, composing music inspired by falling water, um, writing scholarly works uh, about the lessons of the architecture. All of those go a long way in, in not only maintaining relevance of falling water, but also um, yeah, it's perpetuating it the yeah, importance. Yeah. yeah. Keeping it alive and uh, as a creative. Keeps it alive and, and organic, which was the intention. Mm, yeah, which is ever changing, ever yeah. evolving. Well, anything else, Justin? I don't think so. Yeah, no, that was great. Okay, so thank you very, very much. And uh, well, I hope to see you soon either in uh, the Norma Foster Foundation. I, I want to thank uh, thank you again on their behalf. And of course, um, or following what, maybe I should apply for a scholarship myself. <laughs> <laughs> yes, come visit or, or participate in our residency program. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much again. Thank you. Bye. Bye.